What is going on, everybody? This is Brandon from Comic King. Happy Wednesday. Happy new Comic Book Day. Welcome back to the channel, or welcome. If you are new today, we are joined by Steve Engelhart, amazing writer, comic book legend. How are you doing today, Steve? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great. You know, it's a, it's a Wednesday. We're here. We're going to be talking about comic books. And big shout out to the chat for being here as well. If you guys have a question, uh, make sure you ask it. Remember to hit the thumbs up, show support to the channel, subscribe if you have not already. Uh, Steve is a, like I said, a legend in the comic book industry. Many characters to his name, one of which being Shang-Chi getting a movie coming out pretty soon. Other characters which have MCU appearances, Mantis, Star-Lord. Uh, we're going to see Kilowog on the big screens pretty soon from Green Lantern Corps. So I'm super excited for that. Uh, Steve, real quick, what got you into comic books? I just liked them. I mean, um, I read them as a kid. And when I was a kid, it was the 50s. So the general thing to do was outgrow them. And it wasn't hard to do because all there was was the DC, Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman of the 50s. So... There was cool stuff in there, but not enough to keep me interested. But then when I was in college, I got introduced to the Marvel stuff and really liked the Marvel stuff. And by that time, um, other companies were coming along. So I just, you know, I'm just a guy who liked comics and, and uh, decided to go for it. There you go, man. Um, so, yeah, because DC had like Jay Garrick. They had Alan Scott, Green Lantern. Then, of course, the whole the Trinity, which we all know today. Um, well, I'm not. I'm not that old. I wasn't around for the Alan Scott stuff, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I was around for Barry Allen. You know? <laughs> there you go. Barry's Barry's cool too. I know. I know. My main flash is Wally, um, but I know mm -hmm. many people prefer Barry with the with the TV shows and everything. That's what they're first introduced to. Uh, but with Marvel, what was kind of your way into comic book writing, other other than just like reading everything? Well, I mean, I, w I went to college near New York, and so I was able to go to New York. Uh, I went to both companies. This is like 66, maybe. And Marvel, neither one of them knew what to do with a fan walking in the door. This was when, you know, I mean, it was before conventions. I mean, there really weren't any conventions yet. So the idea of a guy showing up and wanting and just interested in the whole thing Marvel was like too small. They just said, look, we, you know, we love you, but we don't have any space or time to do anything. DC was more forthcoming. They kind of go, well, you want to talk to Julie Schwartz? And I'm like, yeah, sure. So I went and Julie gave me half an hour of his time and, and also gave me even some original artwork when I left. And, and so uh, I was, I, I, I walked away from that meeting with Julie Schwartz going, these guys are not demigods, you know? I mean, I could do this <laughs> if I wanted to. Um, and I got out of college, and then I went in the Army. But when I got out of the Army, I went to New York. And, and just sort of everybody had to come to New York in those days because it was before right. Internet, before FedEx. So you had to physically go there, which meant you got to know everybody in comics all the way from, you know, some new guy like Jerry Conway to, like, Wally Wood or Bill Everett. I mean, anybody who was doing comics, you were just part of the club and everybody got accepted. And so I was in the group and I was around and I was doing, you know, stuff to, to kind of keep going. And then I got an offer. I got offered a job on staff at Marvel. And when I took that, they liked to supplement it with uh, freelance work and they liked my freelance work and I liked doing it. And so that's how I ended up you know, I just figured I figured I would get in there somehow. I would, you know, but I had no plan. I just kind of took opportunities as they arose. Right. And then one thing just led to the next, led to the next. And then soon enough, you're drawing probably the best Avengers run of all time. Right. <laughs> Not drawing. <laughs> Not drawing. That was uh, George Perez. That was his yeah. job. But <laughs> yeah. um, kind of speaking about the relationships, was there any like a few people in particular that like you really gelled with or really was like a bigger influence on you? Uh, I know you said like when you came in, Jerry Conman was like the young buck of the group, which is kind of hard to imagine. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, yeah, he was younger than me by a couple of years. But um, uh, well, I mean, I, I worked with Neil Adams 
a lot in the in the early days. Uh, Neil sort of took me under his wing. I was the first guy that he did that for. Um, Dick Giordano um, lived near me up in Connecticut. Um, and then when I went to work at Marvel, I was right next to Herb Trimpey and Johnny Ramita Sr. Uh, and so, you know, and Marie Severin. I mean, everybody at Marvel was very friendly. Once I got in that door, um, you know, I mean, they were all helpful, you know, I mean, they were right. good, they were good people and they were nice to be around, but they would also, you know, explain to me, well, this is what you need to know about this thing or that thing. So, um, but yeah, it would, that Marvel thing was a bullpen the way they claimed it was, it was, it was a group of people who were all there to do the best comics they could. And, and it was all very friendly. So that was all right. Awesome. Right, and that that's really how the industry started. It's just a small ragtag group of people just rotating titles. How did those titles kind of progress over time with people coming into the industry? Were you one of like the mentors to some of them, or how did that really go down? Not so much a mentor because um, once I got established, I'm I'm more. Um, how shall I put this? I grew up in Indiana, but I never really felt like an East Coast. Guy, I went to college in the East. I went to college in Connecticut on the East Coast. I worked in New York on the East Coast. Um, but once I went to California for a vacation, I said, "Oh, I like California." <laughs> so um, Kirby had moved out. I might have been the next person to actually leave the New York area and move to move to California. Um, so I couldn't do much mentoring. Um, cause I was, you know, I was sort of apart from everybody else at that point, but, um, you know, anybody who, you know, I mean, I've, I've handed out advice and, you know, for what it's worth over right. the years when I, when, when it was asked for. Yeah. There you go. Um, who was, who were like some of your favorite characters to write like early on that you really kind of wanted to get in on? Anybody early on anyone. <laughs> i mean early on I, I just was a fan of all comics right i mean right. marvel was my favorite but i liked a lot of the dc stuff and there was also you know gold key and charlton and wally woods thunder agents and all these different things um and i liked all of it so um you know i wrote vampirella i mean you, there's hardly anybody I don't think there's anybody really, well, that's not true, but I mean, by and large, 98% of all the characters are fine by me. And, you know, they offered me the Beast. I'm like, yeah, let's write the Beast. And then they offered me Captain America and the Defenders and then Cap and then the Avengers and then Luke Cage. And, then, you know, I mean, each one of them was like, right. I'm, you know, I'm having a great time doing this. So <laughs> it was, um, you know, there was... I mean, a character that I really wanted to write was Batman. And I thought I would never do that because I was a Marvel guy. And that turned out that I did. But um, right. I don't know that there was anybody else that I said, oh, man, I really I really need to write Thor or, you know, whatever. It's just like, I'll write them all. Right, <laughs> right. Kind of, and that's kind of my theory of life. You know? <laughs> and, and that you did. And is there any one story looking back on that you can kind of say would be like your most proud work? Um, well, again, I mean, this all sounds very political, but um, if you're, you know, if you're writing, you're basically sitting by yourself in a room. And if you're not having a good time, you know, you, you really ought to find a different job. So I found you know, any character that I wrote, I did the best I could, tried to make that character the best I could, you know. So I was happy with, with all that stuff. Um, uh, I mean, a couple things that stand out, my, you know, my Batman run, first Batman run, um, the first Kang story and the Avengers two-part thing between Grant, giant size Avengers and a regular book. And I would say the first issue of Shang-Chi, not to put too fine a point on it, uh, since that's why I'm here. But, uh, you know, but I thought that first issue of Shang-Chi was, was, 
I was really happy with that. Right. And we're, we're not just here to talk about your Shang-Chi. Actually, I did more rereading of your Avengers run than I did right. Shang-Chi. Right. Right. Did. There isn't that much of Shang-Chi for me, from me, you know. So. <laughs> right. Um, but let's kind of dive into that. I can talk about um, your creation of the character, what came about. Well, I have I was writing Doctor Strange at that point, and and thought to myself that if I was going to write a magician, I really should know magic. And I was so I was deeply into like researching tarot and Kabbalah and astrology and all this sort of stuff. So that Strange would sound more like somebody who actually did what he was supposed to be doing. Right. That's just my, you know, that I just do that. I want to write the best Doctor Strange, so I want to figure that out. But then uh, the Kung Fu TV show came along, and I thought I would really be interested in writing Eastern philosophy, writing, you know, something to go to balance out the whole Western magical tradition. Um. And I was with Jim Starlin at the time. We were actually at my house, and Starlin and I watched this show, and we said, we'd like to do something, you know, that that involves that kind of thing. Um, so we went to Marvel. In those days, you did not go in and say, Jim and I want to do a project. I mean, this really, you just, everything was assigned. I mean, you could say, oh, I'd like to do a thing with Jim as a, as a, you know, a one shot or, you know, Jim and I would like to do this thing. That kind of thing could happen. But in general, you didn't go in and say, Jim and I want to do a series together. Um, but we went in and said, Jim and I want to do a series together. And, and Marvel was unimpressed. Marvel did not, they, you know, they did not see any value in Kung Fu in the, in martial arts. Um, and so, one thing that we had decided um, in the TV show, Kwai Chang Kane was played by a white guy. Um, and that was because Bruce Lee had sort of gotten the thing going, but the entertainment poobahs at ABC said, we can't do a series about an all Asian guy. America won't watch that. So they made him half white. So Starlin and I said, we want Shang-Chi to be all Asian. We don't want to do a half white guy. And the poobahs at Marvel said, nope, got to be half white. Got to, you know, can't sell it if there's no white connection. Well, we wanted to do this strip or this. Yeah, we wanted to do this book and like, oh, okay. And then they said his father is... Um, you know, I mean, an international criminal, but I think if we're going to sell this, we need some sort of well-known character. So right. let's make that Fu Manchu. And we're like, well, <laughs> that isn't really what we want to do either. Um, but that was what we needed to do to get this thing approved. So we did it. And right after we started, the whole Kung Fu thing just exploded as a, as a phenomenon. We're not taking credit, at least I'm not. <laughs> Maybe Jim is, but um, it was so quick. I mean, I'm sure we might have contributed a few drops of water to that wave, but I don't, you know, we didn't start that. But it really, you know, Kung Fu just blew up. It just went crazy. And all of a sudden, Marvel's like, oh, this is the greatest idea ever. Let's do, let's turn this monthly book into a, or bi monthly book into a monthly book. Let's do extra books. Let's do a black and white series. Let's do annuals. And so Starlin bailed out after three issues, and I bailed out after five and two, two stories in the black and white book because this had become not what we wanted to do. Um, we right. had, you know, we had a, we had an idea of, of taking it at a, at a different pace and. Um, so then, as I always say, I mean, I think the book, I think, you know, it got handed to, to Doug Manch and Paul DeLacy, who didn't really have much of a handle on it for a while. And then when they got the handle, then they, you know, Doug and various artists, DeLacy first, had this fabulous run for years. I mean, Master of Kung Fu was a great book under those guys. Um, 
you know, all, all Jim and I can say is we created it, right? Um, so that's, I think I answered your question. There, yeah, yeah, they, yeah. Um, there you go. Yeah, because remember when we spoke at Baltimore, I asked you about it. Like, well, we didn't think at the time that it was going to do much, or Marvel didn't think at the time right. it was going to do much. But um, looking at it now, I would say that it has done much. It's done, it's done a lot uh, for a lot of people out there of that race. Now they have someone to kind of look up to. Right. Um, uh, you know, and that's that subject has come up. I mean, you know, so it was two white guys who created Shang-Chi. Uh, on the other hand, there were no Asian guys. <laughs> you know, if we hadn't done it, there was nobody else to do it. Um, Larry Hama was not there yet. Um, you know, Ron Lim was not there yet. I mean, they're, they're it, for better or for right. worse. Jim Lee was, Jim Lee, Rose Montasio came later. Right. There was not a real, it was basically white guys. You know, there were a few black guys, there were a few women, you know, but not, you know, so, um, I can just say we created Shang Chi really with an intent to try to do him right or as best we could or whatever. Um, um, but uh, you know, I mean, so yeah, I'm glad now that the you know that the movie I'll be interested to see right created, written, drawn, directed, acted by you know an all Asian cast and see how that goes. Right. Uh, what are you most looking forward to in that movie? Well, for, uh, they don't consult the, us, us writers. They, they're very good about reading the source material, giving credit for the source material, um, but they don't come to us and say, what did you have in mind, or would you like to take a look <laughs> at this? So I'm not going to see that movie until you see that movie. So all I know is what's in the trailers. Um, but I, from what I can tell, from what I believe I know, it is my story about him being the son of an international criminal, no longer Fu Manchu, uh, and ha and coming to, having to come to grips with that. So that makes me happy, right? I mean, I'm I'm if you do my story and or my character, um, you know, what else am I supposed to ask for? So um, right. I'm looking. I just want to see Shang Chi. You know, on screen, I want to. I want to get used to this guy, um, whose name is escaping me. I, you know, I know him from Kim's Convenience. That's, you know, that's what yeah. I know. Um, uh, I should know the name, but again, I'm not. I'm not. I, uh, I'm horrible with actor names. I know too many comic book writers and artists. And you ask me who, let's say, Tarantino is. I'm like, wasn't he in Star Wars? And everyone's like, no, no, he wasn't. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I should know, but I'm not, as I say, I'm not really involved in the movie. So until the movie's out, I'm not locked in. Right, it. right. But anyway, you know, I mean, I'd be interested. Um, you know, I just, I want to see what they do with what appears to be my story and then what they do with it. Right. And what they kind of do, their little MCU, uh, Kevin Feigeism little twist right. in there. Which right. I, I think it's going to be great. I think we definitely do need a lot more characters like Shang Chi, um, that also gives a lot to look forward to with the MCU, not just with like racial diversity, but because Shang Chi is a very gritty character. Yeah. Um, that that also gives you more more abilities to bring characters like Iron Fist, bring back Charlie Cox for Daredevil. See, I know that name. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or Mike Coulter back as Luke Cage. I know that because you know, I met him, but that's another yeah. reason why. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I wish they would do that too. I, you know, when they came out with um, Iron Fist, see, back when nobody at Marvel believed in this, and we had to kind of get this going, and then boom, it exploded. And then the same people who said, "Oh, there's no future in this," they went and created Iron Fist, right? Okay. So Iron Fist to me is always the Johnny Come Lately. And when he got the TV show, I thought, well, then they're never going to do Shang Chi. You know, I mean. It's unfair, but they're never going to do Shang Chi. So I'm pleased on that level that they're doing the Shang Chi. Well, right? <laughs> there you uh, go. <laughs> and to to your point, in the '80s, didn't they also bring in Frank Miller, who did a very good ninja story for Daredevil? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> so you know, um, 
Kung or martial arts have always kind of been a little bit prominent in in comics, mainly more in the later Bronze Age. I would say, yeah, not about their, their wings. Yes, because um, that's even that was even when uh, Power Man and Iron Fist kind of met in what was it? Was that eighty two? I don't know. know. Yeah. I'm I'm sure someone in, in the chat knows and will correct it. But if I if I know my history, I think that was when it happened because that was when Claremont and Byrne did that story. Okay. Okay, so so there's that. So I'm, I'm kind of glad to see them doing those grittier stories. And the more we see them in the movies, the more we're going to see them in the comics. So that's very well, exciting for, for newer readers, for more modern readers as well. Well, and also, I mean, this this was my idea back in the day, but but it's I did not communicate it to Marvel, but they came to the same conclusion. It's not It's not rocket science. But, I mean, you've got the entire Marvel superhero mythos going on. But if you want to bring in an Asian character, you get the whole flying ghosts, you know, hidden dragon, you know, that whole right. martial arts thing, which if you put the two together, you're going to get an even more spectacular movie. And I believe right. that's what they've done. So Right. It's almost like um, adding a new religion in there. You know, I'm a, I'm a martial artist. I used to teach karate for years. Okay. Um, so like that kind of way, that lifestyle of a martial artist is very powerful and it's, it, it affects everything, right? So it can, it, it can really affect even more characters in the MC that we're seeing today. Um, Shang-Chi Shang will be there for years to come simply because of what he brings to the table, which is completely different yet needed. For right. a lot of a lot of the characters in the universe. Well, that lifestyle of the martial artist is what the original idea right. was, right? But that but it got away from that. Right. Um, right. Yeah. yeah. So I you know, I'm I'm looking forward to it. Um, um I will just I will just say that I get invited to the premieres of the various movies that my characters are in. And so I've been invited to the Shang-Chi premiere, but I'm probably not going because of COVID. You know, I don't see the idea of sitting in the theater for three hours um, in Los Angeles. It has <laughs> to be being, necessary. You know, as being like a good idea. So um, I'm going to, you know, the alternative is to go to just your random theater and, and see it. Right, or you can get the premiere access on Disney Plus if you have that avenue. Well, that's what I figured to do, but somebody told me yesterday that they're not going to do it. They're not going to have premiere access. That's maybe because of the Scarlett Johansson thing. I don't know, but uh, I I just heard that it's not going to be on there. But I hope that that's wrong. Right. Because, because I'd be happy to you know pop thirty well, bucks and. <laughs> right. I mean, if it's for the whole family. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of what I did with Black Widow. I saw it opening night, and then I had my surgery, um, I had my hip surgery, and then I wanted to watch it with my family because they were in town for the weekend just to help me out. And I was like, "Oh yeah, let me drop thirty dollars." So I'm in the. I ended up paying almost fifty dollars just to watch a movie twice. So I don't think I'm doing that for Shang Chi, but it was still a great experience both in the theaters and at home. So you can tell me then. I mean, you pay the thirty bucks. That's a one-time deal. You don't nope. get. You can you watch it like, over again. Huh? You can watch it again. It's oh, your yeah, movie once, at that point. Once you paid it, okay. Right, it, it's your movie at that point. Um, so uh, other than Shang Chi, you know, you kind of had some other characters appearing in the MCU. You've had Star Lord. You've had Man. You can give us a little bit more information about their creative process. That would be very helpful to us. Well, Star Lord. Um. I have since seen other people do this and I didn't like it. So I'm sure that it was a bad idea, but I wanted to create a guy, a real asshole, really. I mean, a guy who was just unlikable. And, and my idea for that series was going to be, he was going to travel through space and, and become likable, become, become enlightened along the way, you know, I mean, grow into his, into his situation. But I wrote one issue in which he was unlikable, and then I left Marvel. So it was up to Claremont and other people to sort of go, okay, well, now what do we do with him? Um, so by the time he got to the movies, well, I mean, I will say, if I had a list of all the people that I created as to who, which ones would be starring in movies, he would have been at the bottom of the list. 
I wouldn't. I would never have thought that he would be, you know, what he is. <laughs> he's but, doing a great job. Yeah, well, well, being that asshole. <laughs> yeah, but he's but he's a lovable asshole, right? Yeah. I mean, so, um, so I really liked the movie. As I said, I didn't see the movie until we all saw the movie. I didn't know what it was, um, but I really liked it. Um, and then Mantis was a character that I that's become a thing. I mean, not to any great extent. The only, the only relationship between the Mantis on screen and the Mantis in the comics is that they're both female. They have right. no other overlapping concept. She had, you know, my Mantis had a speech a way of speaking. She had a color. She had, you know, a look, all these different things. All that got jettisoned. Um, so I, you know, I've said, and I, you know, it's like, thank you for putting Mantis in there. I wish it were, you know, a little, a little closer to the, to the, to the original. Um, but I, I, as I have said to Pom Clementi off in person, I like you, <laughs> and I like, and I like the Mantis on screen. You know, I would say the same thing to her. I like you. I like you a lot. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, she's she's great, and and. You know, I got nothing. It, it's not a reflection upon what she's doing at all. It's just not the same character, uh, but it has the same name, and so you know, um, uh, that's you know, that's a good thing. Right. Um, but you know, that's the that's the deal. I mean, you don't. It all it all belongs to the MCU now. At that point. Right. I mean, and so I totally recognize that pretty soon the only mantis that most people are going to know is is the one on screen. Right. right. Um, so that's that's just the way that goes. But well, ho hopefully when they reprint that your issues of the Avengers in that omnibus, hopefully I think it should be coming out sooner. But I'll have to double Everybody check. Stuff. Right. All the all the time. So there they the should time. be easier to get so and I, I highly recommend you guys do so you get a little bit of an origin in the Kree scroll war um in issue 130 i believe 131 um which is which is uh probably one of my more favorite issues you get some kang in 127 yeah. 129 and then you have the first meeting with thanos which is behind us in 125 that's another comic that i really wanted to talk to you about this is one of my first introductions of your work um, it was this one, then 167, where like the first two Avengers books I had during your run. If you can talk about that issue uh, and how Thanos kind of met the Avengers and how you guys plan to do that for us. Well, that's primarily Starlin. I give him most of the credit for that. He was writing um, Captain Marvel and had Thanos in that and, you know, wanted to have Thanos fight the Avengers. And so much of comics in those days was again personal relationships. Starlin and I were good friends, you know. So it was nothing for him to come and say, "Can we do something in the Avengers?" And I'm like, "Sure." Um, so um, I'm trying to remember, you know, how we plotted that exactly, but um, you know, I was just doing I was doing an Avengers story really to buttress his Thanos arc in... in right. It was kind of like tail yeah. ending it. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's a good story and I'm happy with it, you know. But uh, it was, you know, he was the guy who was primarily driving that thing. And so um, I, was, I was just there to, you know... Clean, you know, tart it, it up, lot, it up, whatever. Make it, all I make it a little bit more tidy. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, which again, this, this is one of my favorite issues that you that you it guys. Was nice. that. Yeah, it was that was one, a great issue. It was really, you know, right. Just the way like Thanos came in, the Avengers didn't really know what to do. They turned to Vision, and Vision didn't know what was going on, so they just decided to attack him. That's basically what yeah. happened. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. This is a question that we ask everyone on the show. Uh, most of the people in, of the audience are X-Men fans. I'm a huge X-Men fan. So who is your favorite X-Men character? Um, 
know that I have one. Um, I go back, you know, again, my first era pretty much encompassed the original X-Men, right? So I guess I'd have to say the Beast, since I went ahead and wrote the Beast, and I used all the other X-Men of the time as guest stars a lot. And, and, and I mean, there was a period when between the old X-Men and the Claremont Byrne X-Men, when the X-Men were not being published in a regular book. So I used them as guest stars in Captain America. I used them in, in um, right. Avengers, you know, I mean, they were there to be used by anybody. And so I, I, as people have said, I was kind of the X-Men writer in that era because nobody else was doing much with them. Um, but, you know, I liked them all. I mean, so I, the obvious answer is the Beast. But, I mean, I, um, I liked um, Scott and Gene, you know. And then, and then when Claremont um, and Byrne took over and did all that new stuff, um, I liked all that. Uh, but right. I can't say there was anybody there. I mean, there were a lot of good characters in there, but there was nobody that I'd say, oh, yeah, that's my favorite. You know? so. Right, that really stood out. I guess when you're writing other stuff, you're kind of distracted by what's kind of standing out until you have to write them yourself. Yeah. Um, if you can go back and really do any story differently or give it like a slightly different pitch, which story would that be? Because I know you worked on a lot of stuff. Yeah, I don't know that I would do that. I mean, again, I think I said that I... I don't know it was a good idea to make Star-Lord quite as unlikable as I made him, so maybe I would change that. All right. But I was talking to somebody recently who was pointing out in West Coast Avengers, the run I did where Mockingbird got raped and then killed the Phantom Rider for having done that, and and she was unrepentant about it because she was a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent, and that's what S.H.I.E.L.D. agents did. But Hawkeye... Her husband was an Avenger, and he didn't think that's what Avengers did. Somebody said, wasn't he being very chauvinistic there? I mean, he didn't seem very interested in his wife. He was more interested in... Uh, kind of the principle. In the principle. Um, and I thought about it, and I thought, well, but that's who he was. I mean, these days, you would be more attentive to the woman's right. uh, thing. But that's not who he was at the time. And so I don't really, I don't think there's much of anything that I would change, really. Um, you know, comics were written for the moment in those days. I mean, nobody right. knew they were going to be making movies and all this kind of stuff. And nobody knew that it would still be reprinted 50 years later. Um, but I don't, I don't, there's nothing, I say this, and I'm sure somebody can point something out to me that I'm not remembering, but I mean, there's nothing that I'm really embarrassed about or feel that I, you know, got wrong in the, you know, in the moment. So I'm, I'm content with it all. Right, right, right. Um, and then after Marvel, you went over to DC. What was that kind of process um, like for you personally, going from one industry to the other? Well, there's different levels to that. Um, DC came to me and I quit Marvel, wasn't planning on doing comics, and DC came and said, would you come over and do for the Justice League what you did for the Avengers? You need to give them all personalities, you need to give them interesting stories. And it was true that DC's characters were pretty one-dimensional at that point. So from a comic book standpoint, it was fun to do that. You know, it was fun to go over and take all these characters that I thought were lesser characters, but also characters that I was never going to write, um, trying to see could I, how would I do the best version of the Atom, you know, how would I do that kind of thing. The one that I really did want to write was Batman, and so I asked for, you know, the individual Batman series and got that. Um, so at that point, it was fun, you know, it was, it was fun. I don't think the Atom is ever going to be as good as the he basic Marvel the story, character. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, I tried to do a great, you know, a great right. Atom and a great Aquaman and a great, you know, as they stood. Um, and that was fun because, as I said, if you're trying to do that, then you're entertaining yourself. Um, unfortunately, the Batman that I wrote, they, you know, turned it into a movie where they ripped me, off, ripped me off for credit and then kept using it over time and have never 
you know, uh, given me any credit for it. So I ended up, everything that happened after I wrote that stuff was, was uh, depressing. But uh, in terms of going to DC in the beginning and thinking, oh yeah, I'm gonna, you know, gonna write the Justice League and then I'm gonna write Batman. That was a good thing. Right. Um, do you think that writing the Justice League would have been very similar to the uh, Avengers and Squadron Supreme arc you did? Because a lot of the Squadron Supreme characters are very re reminiscent of the Justice League cast. Yeah, but they're different. Um, I mean, I've, I've always said to writers, you know, people ask me about writing, you can take Batman and make one change and call him, you know, Mouse Man. Or something. I mean, you can make him exactly the same except for one thing. And if you actually pursue that character, pretty soon they're going to diverge. You're not going to be writing a shadow Batman. You're going to be writing this other guy because the one change means he's going to react to things differently. He's going to see the world differently. Um, and so, A, I know where all the Squadron Supreme people came from, but I didn't feel that the Justice League, when I was writing the Justice League, that they were the same people. They were different people. And the second thing is, I do try to find what's um, unique to each character. Uh, when I was doing Green Lantern Corps later, somebody said to me, how can you write a group where they all have the same powers? And I said, it's not about the powers. It's about the people in the group, you know, and that's right. kind of my deal there, too. I mean, writing the Justice League was writing the Justice League. It wasn't... Um, wasn't writing the Squadron Supreme, and I was trying to find what what was cool about these various right uh, people, you know. Right, and if uh, do you think if DC uses their story or how you brought in Kilowog, do you think they'll give you that credit that they didn't in the Batman film? They have given me and Joe Staten credit for Kilowog. They do not give us credit for Guy Gardner, right? Um, DC says, well, Guy Gardner was created by John Broom and Gil Kane. And I go, yes, that character was. He was used three times and then and then forgotten about. We created an entirely new character, called him Guy Gardner. We should get credit. DC is like, nope. DC is not, not a creator-friendly company. Um, and I've got to say that Disney certainly is. Disney has been very gracious. Know, yeah. yeah, they've been very they've been very good about this stuff, um, and DC has been very bad about this stuff. So, um, uh, does that make you more excited for watching the MCU movies than watching anything coming out on HBO or coming out from DC? Well, just because the MCU movies are so much better than <laughs> I thought, I knew that's what you were going to say. I was like, I'm hoping he just goes that way. Well, you know, I mean. What what? The first Wonder Woman movie was good. The second one was terrible. It was terrible. You know, I mean, <laughs> it's like they they don't know how to do it, and they won't. They you know they need their own Kevin Feige, but they don't have him. So, you know, I don't know that there's any DCU movie where I go, man, I'm really looking forward to that. It's just like, well, you know. How bad is it going to be? <laughs> <laughs> I am very excited for the Batman movie coming out with uh, Bat Pat Robert Pattinson. Uh, we'll that see. trailer looks amazing. And the fact that it's rated R means that they're going to be diving into more adult themes with Batman. I think it's going to be much better. Well, it but could be. I can see why no one else has that ringing endorsement after what they've put out. Well, um, but, the, I, you know, it's like... They don't do Batman. They do Christopher Nolan's Batman. They do Robert Pattinson's Batman. I mean, there's, there's there no is no trilogy. there is no Batman at at the in the DCU, right? The way there's, I mean, everybody in the Marvel universe is who they are, right? I mean, it's not like we're reinventing um, Star Lord. As we, you know, somebody else is going to do it and they're going to do it differently. It's like, no, all these guys, we know who they are, but you don't know who the Batman is at DC. Right, right. Like, I mean, it's always changing. You had Ben Affleck for a few years. You had right. uh, 
Um, you you had a uh, Chris George Miller, Clooney. You had, you had George Clooney. You had um, uh, Val Kilmer. You had. I liked Michael Keaton. I thought Michael, Michael Keaton, Keaton was really um, was you know was good um, at it. But and, and and look at us early. We said we didn't know actors' names. We just named all the Batman. So there you I go. Know them, yeah. <laughs> now it's coming to it. Um, but or there is not a Catwoman. There has been multiple Catwomen, but there's no right. singular uh, Catwoman. But uh, I think you can say the same thing about Spider Man and how each iteration of Spider Man. You can say the same thing about the X Men. A bunch of uh, just for sake of argument, you know. Um, well, I mean, they did the they did the Tobey Maguire. I run off actor's name again, and I thought that was fine. And then they said, "No, that doesn't Rick count. Now we're going to do the next guy, Andrew Garfield." And then they then they said, "No, that doesn't count." That doesn't and suck. <laughs> um, and and we all like Tom Holland. Holland, yeah. I mean, you know, we like him, and he seems more like the Spider Man, the real Spider Man, anyway. You know, um, so I mean. Again, if DC were to say, okay, those Christopher Nolan movies, not doing that anymore. Now we're doing something. But they don't treat it the same way. Um, I So for the sake of argument, you could make that argument. But I kind of see we didn't get a real Spider-Man until we got one as part of the MCU. The, you right. Know, uh, the right. Sony That's stuff is like off to the side somewhere. Right. I mean, Marvel doesn't make deals with anyone that's not Spider-Man. I mean, they I mean, I mean, I'm excited for what they're bringing in with Fox. I'm excited to see the Fantastic Four uh, reinvented into the MCU. I hope they get that. I mean, again, their track record is great, but I really do hope they get that one right because the Fantastic Four. Yeah, well, Fantastic Four. Yeah, because those first two movies, it's like, no, and <laughs> you no. just you just didn't, you know, you didn't get it. Um, <laughs> they had good people in it, you know. I mean, there were some good people doing that stuff, yeah, but it's I like Chris Evans was a very convincing human torch until we and I like Michael Chiklis as the thing, right? Um, right, but story wise, no, no, it just didn't work. But and I think that's if you really want to say, like, you, you have the Marvel Universe, it all started really with the Fantastic Four. Um, yeah. once you even in today's comics, if the Fantastic Four doesn't have that Stanley Kirby feeling, I personally don't read it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, that's just the way I am. I feel like every Fantastic Four story should have those same kind of vibes, that same feeling once you're done, once you put the issue down, it should feel 100% like, okay, Stanley would approve or Kirby would, would approve. Um, yeah. I don't think that was the same with those movies, though. I think they would both just shake their head the whole time. <laughs> um. But yeah, I'm excited for that. I'm excited for uh, the X Men. Uh, what are what are you most looking forward to uh, going forward, whether it's in comics or in the movie industry? Um, well, I'm just sort of taking it as it comes. I mean, again, I I don't I have no personal stake in in the movies. Uh, I mean, other I have a personal stake in the movies, I guess, but it's not like I'm really <laughs> dying. You know, with um, and uh, I mean, I'm I'm interested to see the Eternals just because I never thought much of the Eternals. So it's like, what are they? Are they going to make that work too? You know, right. um, um, I'll be interested to see the second Black Panther, how they handle that with no Chadwick Boseman. You know, right. um, uh, so I guess it's more a technical thing with me. How are they actually going to do this? And I'm really looking forward to it. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what they do, I guess, is the right and kind of like how they spin it. Um, yeah. if you could have any one of your stories that you wrote in Marvel, whether it's like the Defenders, uh, Doctor Spear, uh, the story in Doctor Strange, uh, be put to the MCU, which one in particular would, would you think? Um, I might do, um, couple of the Doctor Strange stories, the one where he meets God and the one where he meets Sylvan Dagger and dies. Um, yes. <laughs> you know, I mean, um, and I think that's a good, I mean, Benedict Cumberbatch is a great Doctor Strange. Um, and, and you know, I really like that first movie. Um, and, you know, I mean, the next one's going to have Scarlet Witch in it and probably Loki from, from 
what I can tell from the TV stuff, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't know, but, um, so it'll be interesting to see a Doctor Strange movie that's got other characters in it as well. Um, but again, that's the kind of stuff that intrigues me as a writer. How do you do that? You know, how are you going to pull that off? Right. Um, so yeah, a couple Doctor Strange stories. I think, as I said, I think the first Shang-Chi was one of my favorite stories, and that's what they're doing here in the Shang-Chi movie. Um, You know, I, but there's, so there's, there's nothing, I don't know, I'd say that's my, you know, right, right, right. such a peak that I would really want to see that one over anything else. Right. It's right. Kind of like, it's kind of like you asked me 45 minutes ago about, you know, getting, which character did I want to write? Well, I want to write all <laughs> well, of them. Well, write all of them. You it's kind of the same them. thing with the movies. You know, I want to see them all, you know. <laughs> you want to see what they can do with all of them. Yeah. So if you could go back and write a character, let's say you came back to comic books and you could write a character of your choosing that you never worked on before, uh, who would that be? Well, I pretty much worked on everybody. I mean, I, I never wrote Spider-Man in his own book, but I wrote him as a guest star. I never wrote the X-Men in their own book, but I wrote them as guest stars. Um, other than that, I mean, you know, you can write Daredevil. Did, who didn't I write? You know, I mean, did you write Daredevil? I don't. Sorry, who? Oh, Daredevil. I wrote one issue of Daredevil. Um, I wanted to follow Frank Miller. I wanted to, you know, I thought it's going to be really, really hard to follow Frank Miller. I want to take a crack at that. Can I make that work? And and so I got the gig, and I wrote one issue, and then um, um, hmm, I'm blanking her name, but the Andrew editor. Andy? Or not, she was an artist at the time. No, yeah. um, I don't know. I don't know the editor. Of the anyway, there was an editor who said I want to do it, and they took it away from me. Um, oh, it probably was Anna Senti. Anna Senti, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not, you know, I don't know Anna Senti really, so I don't know. It's not like I bear a personal grudge, but I mean, I was really looking forward to doing Daredevil, and then I got out outranked. Um, so. Uh, you know, um, and what would your pitch would have? What would you have told in that Daredevil story? Well, I mean, Miller had done this great stuff about really getting him down into the grit of you know New York City and junkies and all that good stuff. And uh, my thing was going to be now that he'd accepted that that's where he belonged, then the Black Widow was going to come in and say, "Come on, let's do international stuff." And, and so catching in between those two worlds, between, you know, wanting to be the man of the people on the street and wanting to help Black Widow, with whom he had a long relationship, do right. sort of more, you know, superhero stuff, quote unquote. I thought that would be an interesting thing from his standpoint as to how do you reconcile these two, two worlds that you've been a part right. of in both cases. So that's where I would have gone with it. Um, um, and I think we kind of like set that up in the one issue that I did and then and took it, it over. Off. Yeah. And then it went off in a different direction. Right. That, that would have been really interesting. You know, um, I think about it now and Daredevil isn't one to travel the world. And when he does, it's very hard for him. Right. You know, thinking in that new environment, especially like he can't see, but he can still feel everything. But right. Um, for his, from his perspective, you know, also, uh, he's a religious man, so you'd still have to attend church. That, that would have been very interesting. Do you think you would have also, like, used a lecturer or brought, like, Silver Sable in there, who's a, who could have been used at the time, or Probably, other? Probably, yeah. Yeah, that, I mean, that would have been kind of cool to bring in Silver Sable as well when they were yeah. over there. As far as Electra goes, I mean, I, I do, um, I offer... I honor, let's put it that way. I honor people who created things. Like when I did Batman, I made sure to mention Gardner Fox and John Broom and so forth. I managed to get those names right. more or less in there because I wanted to, to, you know, acknowledge that situation. So Electra is a Frank Miller character. And, you know, I would not have done it if, you know, I would have talked to Frank about it. You know, do you, is that cool with you if I use her? And if it wasn't, I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have used her. But if it was, I would have used her. Sure. Right. 
and that that even brings up something that I remember reading in your first Avengers issue 104, where you use the character. I, uh, why am I forgetting on his? Why am I forgetting his name? Um, kind of like a mystical character that was from the, either the third or the second issue of Avengers that was in there. It was uh, during the whole Grim Knight arc. Yeah. Um, I'm forgetting him, but did you did you understand in uh in word? Even though he wasn't a big character, it was like the first time we saw him since those early Avengers issues. Yeah, I don't. I'm not exactly sure who you're talking about. I did, you know. I brought back Wonder Man later on in the thing, and that was cool. That, that was the thing. Um, the Grim was Reaper. It? We had the Grim Reaper. Yeah, it was. It was someone else who was with the Grim Reaper. Um, oh, the Space Phantom. There yeah, you go. Space yeah, because yeah. he was from like the second or third issue of Avengers. Yeah, we, yeah, yeah. we didn't see him since until 105. Yeah. Um, which which I thought that was cool, like to your point that we were just talking about. Yeah, I mean, um, I thought the Space Phantom was an interesting. You know, I mean, it, that's my answer to everything, right? He was, he was thought, fun. <laughs> thought it would be fun to do. But, <laughs> right. but, you know, what what can I find in him that that you know is is there but hasn't been done yet? You know, whatever. Right. Right, and then um, you went on to do Silver Surfer later in the late eighties. Um. How did you yeah. kind of land? How did you go about like landing each of these characters? Were they assigned throughout the eighties, or were you at a time in your career where you got to pick and choose who you wanted? No, it's just that we didn't do that. I mean, it was it was, um, you know, they would say, "We want you to write, call the, the Slayer," and and Mike Blue's going to draw it. It's like okay, you know, I mean, whatever. Um, that was that was the way it was. Um, they assigned, you know, they came to me and said, we want you to write this. Um, and then they said, we want you to do it with Marshall Rogers, you know, which was fine by me, you know, I mean, all, both of those things are like, yeah, okay, sure. But it was, it was, that was shooter, you know, um, deciding that stuff. Um, but my big trick there was, Shooter did not want to let the surfer off the earth. And I said, oh, that's so boring. That's been done so many times. you got to let him off the earth. And right. then for whatever reason, he changed his mind. And so I was able to get him off the earth. And that opened up, right. up to, you know, the entire cast of the Marvel space people, you know. Right. Which made total sense. I mean, I, I, never, I never had a problem with it. But sure, <laughs> for a while, you know. Um... Uh, uh, I mean, you know, at Marvel in those days, you had pretty much in the early days, you had complete creative freedom. In the in the eighties, you had pretty much creative freedom, um, but that pretty much involved having to get Shooter to sign off on stuff. And Jim sometimes could be bulky about new ideas, <laughs> uh, so uh, you know. But anyway, no, I you know. All right, and and the first thing you did was you took him back to Shalaba, which was kind of a great, um, great. He'd that was been, a great story as well. Well, um, he'd been, you know, <laughs> he'd been flying to, into the distance, being sad about Shalaba for years, which is what I wanted to get rid of. But I mean, once he got off the Earth, the first place he's going to go is go is go, go back Shalabal. to home. Go but her life has gone on too, right? I mean, so it was right. So um, it was a great reunification and if there are any server surfer fans watching this right now which there's no reason why you shouldn't be i highly recommend you check it out 1987 um it was that was one of my first introductions to the character as well was that was this first few issues that i brought yeah, yeah. Oh and you had galactus which was so well done as well and well, both of those characters you know that's stan and jack mostly jack probably um you know and they were great in in their first incarnations and I right. don't know, galactus ever didn't get great but the surfer just got into this one note thing about you know i'm so sad because i'm trapped here you know oh i can't get off the earth oh it's like yeah okay can we move on from there right right and eventually he has and and now he's a great character um are you still are you still reading comics to this day or no i'm not step back? no when i got out of comics in like 2005 which was a while ago now, but um, I, I was going to write novels, so I just started reading novels, you know, long-form stuff, and, and um, 
uh, that was what I immersed myself in. So I didn't. I just sort of gave up. Not gave up, but just didn't have time for comics right. at that point. I was I was looking in other directions, and you know, right. hey, when I come back, people would come up, and I will say, people would come up to me over the years. They go, "Oh, you really need to read this issue of this thing because it's like really good." And I go, "Okay," and I run down to the comic book store, and it's sold out. You know? <laughs> and you're uh, not going to find it anywhere else for cover price. <laughs> well, I mean, you might find it, but it's just like, oh, really? I can't just go to the store and buy it anymore because they only print the exact number that people have ordered, you know, plus right. or minus five or something. I mean, it's it's it was a different it's right. a different industry now. It, it depends on the books, you know, and a lot of people today are buying duplicate copies. Some people are buying just to resell, which I know that's not a, that wasn't a thing from back in the day. That's not how I collect Right. Um, I, I, I feel like I'm a more old fashioned kind of consumer myself. I just take everything and read it and goes in the bag and board and it stays safe. And I'll read it again if I please. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> and then you have like the grading companies now, which, which I don't have many, probably just this book behind me, which is a first daredevil, which I, which I barely paid for, which is great. Yeah. Um, um, but if you were to return to the industry, would you be open to that or? To what writing? To, uh, to writing again in the comic industry. Oh yeah, well I like to write. I mean I'm still, uh, you know, to this day I write stuff, um, possibly only for my own edification. I mean I'm because I'm not really plugged in, um, but I like to write. I like to tell stories, and and um, you know I mean. I've said this before. I mean, if if they if somebody came to me and said you can do anything you want to do, go at it. That would be possibly probably attractive to me, but that's not really how the business runs anymore. Now you know there's all these different levels of editorial, and it all has to fit into the overall grand scheme of things and all that. Um, I mean, once upon a time they came to me and they said here. Write Captain America. Do anything you want to do. <laughs> you know, it's a little hard to to you know come and write characters now where you can't do everything you want to do. Where there might be reasons why you can't, and and some of those reasons might even be good reasons. But but none of that was in play back in the day. And I mean, I didn't I didn't get into comics with the idea that I could have create complete creative freedom. But that's what they offered me, you know. That's the right. here, you know, go for it. So I liked that. So you know, that was that's how I would want to. That's how I would want to do it. I'd have to be able to just sort of turn the character into whatever I thought he should be. Um, right. And I don't think they're going to offer me that deal. Yeah, probably, so. prob probably not. Um, there's always like kind of the independent industries like with image and, and boom studios where you could do an uh, independent comic but if you wanted to write for the big two i know they're a little bit more restrictive unless you have a seven-year plan like jonathan hickman and his new x-men run right. but yeah. but other than that what what novels are you working on uh kind of let the people know well it's not even novels it's i i wrote i wanted to do this story I wanted to do a story about a small town with 20 people that we would follow in that town. Two of those people get superpowers, but we don't know which two out of the 20 they are. Um, and meanwhile, the other 18, well, in fact, all 20 of them are having their own stories. I wanted to do a thing where instead of having some some heroes and then some background people, I wanted to do a thing where everybody had a story, and and the other eighteen are not superhero stories. There's private detective, there's murder, there's love, there's all these different things going on in this town, amongst all these people. And when the pandemic hit, I'd been playing around with that idea for a long time. And when the pandemic hit, and I was staying home every day, I thought, well, let's write that. So I did write that. What I discovered in doing it is. It came out to be 420 pages long. It's it is seven 60 page graphic albums. Chap it's all chapters of one mini, right? It's it's a mini, but it's right. but each part is 60 pages, which means the total is 420. And I'm really not convinced 
that there's any artist out there who wants to draw 420 pages uh, of a book, you know. Um, if one's listening, please get in touch. But, you know, I, I got done and I was really happy with the result. And, you know, but it was becoming clear to me as I got close to the end, nobody's ever going to draw this. So it's a comic book script that made me very pleased, you know, made me happy sitting alone in a room coming up with this, making it work. Trying to get 20 stories to work simultaneously is, a, is an interesting challenge for a writer, and I like challenges, and so that, you know, all that stuff worked out. But you'll probably never see it because, you know, all right. nobody's, nobody's going to turn it into a comic. I wrote something a little shorter about, uh, it's a moon noir, it's a story on the moon um, that's very, that's very noir. Um, that's only four issues and that's, and they're only 28 pages each. So there might be somebody out there who wants to draw that. Right. Um, but, um, at, you know, I guess a corollary to my saying, yeah, I like to sit in a room and entertain myself. I did that and, and, put it into the mass market and apparently entertained other people for many years. But the actual process of sitting there and entertaining myself is the same, whether you ever see it or not, you know, <laughs> so, uh, and right. I'm, you know, um, so that's what I'm doing. I'm, you know, I'm writing there you stuff. Go, man. There you go. Uh, you know? We have a little show in the comic community, which, which we, we all watch on Tuesday. It's called Lame or Frame, where you draw characters. You have two minutes to draw a character from a specific universe, and each week is a different universe, right? So let's say it's Nintendo theme one week. I think that was last week's. Yeah. Or it was a week that I watched the show. I don't remember. But, um, well, let's just say some people can't draw, such as myself. So you may get some some artists in there, maybe interested. That sucks. You might get someone that's decent. You never know. <laughs> but <laughs> it's well, very... I probably, wouldn't it. probably wouldn't do it unless I thought the guy was decent. I'm yeah, not, we you know, know a few people. Again, I don't have to do. I don't have to publish it. So it, if I'm gonna do it. It's gonna be with somebody who can do good art. There you go. There you go. But as long as you got the entertainment for yourself, I guess that's all that matters. To me, I don't know if. It, <laughs> You know, I, I you know I was a mass market guy for many years, so I do understand. Kind of like the satisfaction. There, people, you know, people can Will predict buy. about it and, and so on and so forth. Um, right. So I'm not I'm not not trying not to put it out there, but but I'm just sort of following these stories wherever they lead, and if they don't lead, there you go. Oh um, my! They don't. I just saw this question pop in the chat. I want to highlight it because I really liked it. What is the best advice an editor gave you? Uh, Hopefully it wasn't I'm doing Daredevil. <laughs> yeah. I, um, yeah, no, that wasn't it. Well, uh, I think that when I was, when I wrote my first issue of The Beast, um, I, I brought it in the day it was due and I talked to Archie Goodwin. Um, and I said, you know, Archie, you know, I've got, I've got like these things that I want to say here, um, and there's no room for them. So how do I make that work? And Archie said, you know, don't make it work. I mean, you know, if you've got stuff that you want to say and you can't say it here, say it in the next issue. You know, I mean, it's like, I that was my, you know, I was just starting, and I was like, oh, I got all these things I want to say, you know. And the idea that, like, no, you can, you know, you can develop these things over time. Um, the other thing was um, Dick Giordano said to me once, he said, I'm really glad I'm an inker because, you know, every writer I know has burned out doing comics. And I was just getting started as a writer. And I thought, I'm not going to do that. And, and because of that actually is why, you know, I would do comics for like five or six years and then I would bail out for five or six years and then, you know, come back again. It was like if I thought it was it was fun for me to sit in a room by myself and think of new Captain America story and then a new Avengers story and then a new Doctor Strange story and then whatever. One one after the other. But after a certain amount of time, I got to where my brain was going to turn to cheese, you know, just from having to do it right. every time. It's the flip side of that. Got to do it every month. Um, 
and so I actually the stuff from Giordano might have been the most important thing where he, you know because I was just you know I was starting to write I never thought about stopping writing and the idea of you might want to do that every once in a while you know and go refresh yourself do something else um, yeah I would credit that probably is it that's what Giordano said um, so I would say if you want to get into comics Mr. Questioner I mean you know go for it but you know if you ever find that you're like just turning it out and you're not really enjoying it then take a break take a break yeah. oh well thank you thank you so much and a big shout out to the chat for being here steve thank you for devoting your time today um i don't want to attend cons until the pandemic is more under control how can i get something signed by you is there any are you still doing signatures you still doing uh, yeah yeah um my web page is just steveenglehart.com and there's an email contact thing on that. Just, you know, drop me a line, tell me what you want to do. We'll figure it out. There you go. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for being here and the links for everything are in the description below. So you can uh, find Steve Englehart on his website. That's what I did. Um, or you can just go to steveenglehart.com. It's not that hard to remember. Um, you just have to know how to spell no. Englehart. <laughs> but thank you so much for being here, man. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. No problem. And see everybody next time.